I mean, where's the first Democratic caucus held? Iowa, and what is the biggest, you know, most important corn and soybean producer? It's Iowa. I mean, there's, you know, it's not a coincidence. So politically, you know, in reconciling these two problems, it, it's the, the solution begins politically, and it's a tough, it's a very tough sell. I mean, reforming the political system is probably the first step, and that's a huge project, which then goes back to this notion of a system. I mean, we like to focus on food as if it were separate, but food is intimately connected with all these other systems, in this case, politics, and foreign policy as well. everyone should um, try to do this and my question is as college students especially at this university as an example you have to live on campus for two years in your freshman year there are no there is no place to cook you have a microwave and um, a small fridge you can't even have a toaster but you're trying to hire education you're trying to you know help I mean, what are we supposed to do in this situation because you can't cook you don't have a choice if you live far away from your home. Right, and this is, you know, it's real, and there's, and, you know, I, I sympathize entirely. I mean, and there are situations like that where people are limited in what they can do. Their life situation doesn't allow them to sort of take these steps. And I suppose what I would suggest in that case is, you know, see if you can take on the sort of the communal aspects of food. I heard a lot of students talking about really, um, you know the fact that getting together for dinner is like that's when they get to reconnect in, in even in the in the, the food in the cafeteria getting together and making that so you can't produce the food but you still sort of get the the communal aspect of it I mean there are times when you just, there's nothing you can do about it except make yourself more aware and educate yourself um, I don't you, you can't beat yourself up about that you sort of have to deal with it but you have to sort of plan for the time when you are going to have that that independence and that power over your life I've been to a lot of campuses where students are getting together and they're having group homes that are built around food, they're built around cooking, and they're mainly trying to save money. But one of the things they're discovering is that in that sort of group process, there's a lot of other intangibles that come from that. So I would, I would encourage that, but there are times when you simply can't do anything, and you use that time to sort of prepare for the times where you can. So in your book, you talked about how uh, before the food system has been industrialized, Europe was approaching uh, famine, and my question is, now that we rely on uh, industrialized meat processing and the Haber-Bosch process, do you think that we can feed, you know, approaching 7 billion people without that? Here's a great question. It's like, well, we, we've got all these people now, and part of the reason the people's, you know, population is so large is that we have an industrial system that can produce so much food, so if we want to de-industrialize the system, what do we do with all these people? Well, it's not, so, it's not simply the amount of calories we need to produce, it's the kind of calories. And, and you, many of you probably know that when you devote your calories to making meat, it's not very efficient. It takes, you know, it takes a lot of corn to grow a pound of steak. Depending on how the numbers you use, um, it's, it's about seven pounds of corn for every pound of steak, or every pound of cow. And then once you do the processing, because so much of the cow is thrown away, it's about 20, 20 pounds of grain for a pound of steak. And if you think about all the land that went in to grow that corn and the water and the fertilizer, it's hugely inefficient. Now, we do this in this country because we can afford to. But imagine if the rest of the world decided to eat as much meat as we did. It wouldn't work. We'd need five planets. Okay, and we don't have them. We barely have one. So what we need to do is thinking about changing our diets, de-industrializing our diet, which means eating less meat. Now, do you know how much the average American eats in meat every year? Or at least causes to be produced because a lot of it's wasted? About 200 pounds. Think about that, 200 pounds of meat. Now again, a lot of it's wasted, but the point is it was produced for you. And you go to a country like China and they're like 35 pounds. And even in Europe, you know, it's, it's substantially less. You know, it's about 75% of what we eat. Do we need to be eating 200 pounds of meat? No, we probably don't. Can the world afford all of us to eat 200 pounds of meat? It can't. So a big, uh, to me, a huge uh, component of this sort of reforming the system is changing our diets and sort of getting out this notion that we need to have meat at every meal. I mean, I, I enjoy meat, but um, I eat a lot less now that I've sort of done some of this research and seen the effects. And I, I see that same sort of effect in people who begin looking at the system. They go. That's totally unethical for me to consume that much meat, knowing full well that the rest of the world can't and that the planet can't survive. But that's, I think, the first key is sort of deindustrialize 
our diet starting with meat? Good question. Uh, my question is along the similar lines. Uh, recently, uh, Mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg, announced his intention to remove sugary drinks as well as uh, other fattening products from government-assisted programs like food stamps. Uh, to what extent should the government play a role in regulating the production of food, especially in programs that are largely dependent on mass production of food, like supplemental insurance assistance programs and food lens programs? Boy, that's a, that's a good question. It's kind of complicated. I mean, in the case of, of whether to sort of um, subsidize what we call junk food, you know, for, for, for the lower socioeconomic class. Um, I hate the idea of a government telling people how to eat. Food is a really personal subject. I mean, it's deeply personal, and it's, ah, oh, geez, telling people. But on the other hand, when you know that this kind of food is contributing to, you know, poor choices and bad health, and that the public is going to be required to pay for many of the health effects of those bad choices, I think you have a pretty good argument. Um, you know, the tough thing is, is that we've sort of created a system where, where junk food is so cheap, and it's, and, and it's not just the cheapness of it. I mean, as you probably know, many of the poorest live in urban areas that are not well served by regular grocery stores. I mean, you know, I was shocked to learn how many people do their grocery shopping at a 7-Eleven. That's where they get their groceries, where they're paying more for things and the, the quality is lower. You know, so part of the reform there has to be not, not just telling them they can't use food stamps to buy Dr. Pepper, it's finding ways to give them access to better food and showing people, educating them and saying, look, you can actually save money by buying raw materials and cooking, raw ingredients and cooking them in your own home. But that's a huge education. So, so it begins with education, having food education in school. You know, I, I think that that's probably what we're going to have to get to is to be talk to kids about food in a really, you know, substantial way. The, the challenge there is it's sort of like sex, sex education. You know, talking about food, it's a very personal, very political, very ideological subject. And when you start telling young students, here's how you should be eating, and they go home and tell their parents what they're learning, you get a lot of angry parents. You know, I live in a fairly, you know, it's not super hard, right? It's kind of in the middle. Uh, in the country up in Washington State, and a teacher had this idea of sending a food log home with kids. And they were, it's all in one class, uh, first grade through fifth grade. And they just wanted the kids to record what they were eating for a week, and then they were going to talk about it. It seemed harmless. And the teacher got back notes from about half the parents saying, you stay the heck out of our business. Now, we know that, we, I mean, you, you, can, you can guess that many of the parents were worried that they would be judged for what they were eating because they knew that their food habits probably weren't up to snuff. But there's also just a lot of personal, there's a personal nature to this that really has to be taken into account. And government has to be very careful when it starts laying down the law in terms of food choices. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, I, have, I have a question about the, um, about the um, in industries like uh, McDonald's and um, Wendy's and all that stuff. Like you said about the um, beef and chicken and everything else. Like I know, like a while back, um, I think they started with McDonald's and Wendy's started with like the fish sandwiches and mm -hmm. everything else. Have there been like any co competition, like a lot of competition with the fish sandwiches and everything else, like there was with the chicken and the beef? Um, not to the same extent because fish was never as popular as you know the chicken was. Um, and you know, I've talked to people like the head guy at Burger King, and he said, you know, we made salads, and we made apple slices, and we made carrots, and they sat and rotted, because no one bought them. And you know, it's a very self-selecting population that goes into fast food. It, you know, it's the things you learn at home that really govern how you're going to deal with food in the future. It's the kind of food that was at home. In many, in many cases, you know, um, my parents were already sort of under the influence of this sort of industrializing system, and they were making different choices. And it's, it's, you know, it's pretty tough for a kid to, um, to be raised one way and then suddenly turn around and make different choices. And the fast food industry understands that. So um, I haven't seen the same competition with those things, um, you know, and I think that's just a matter of consumer preference. Thank you very much. Good question. I just wanted to first say, um, I think the cure would be uh, for people to just disregard meat completely, entirely. Like, right now the population, about 2%, doesn't eat meat at all. And say that increased to like 20%, like what negative effects do you think that would have on the economy? 
or on anything. You mean if, if we went from, from eating, where 2% of the people don't eat meat to up to 25%? Yeah, just a big increase, yeah. Well, if it happened overnight, it would be huge. It would be a huge impact because there's a whole industry that's dependent or on. Let's say over like five years. You know, I, I don't, I, I don't, I haven't looked at the numbers of what the multiplier effect would be, but let's say that it could be done over a 20-year period because these things take time. You know, farmers that are now producing X number of head would either have to, um, you know, change their business model so they could sell less. Maybe they would try to sell a higher quality beef. A lot of these farmers are, a lot of these uh, beef guys are going into free range, you know, kind of grass fed because that's sort of more popular. It's becoming sort of fashionable. So you're going to see some of that. But in many cases, some of the companies that grow beef now, and a lot of times it's just investors, big investors who come together, you know, they bring one of these, they create one of these operations and they run it as long as they can profitably. They would go take their capital and do something else with it. Yeah, like it reinvests in like other meat, like maybe they would go Maybe, maybe they would go for other meat, or maybe they would say food is a, I don't like that, let's do something else, let's do high tech, you know, let's do iPhones, you know, or, or whatever. Um, capital is, it doesn't really care. It really doesn't. It's just whatever's getting, you know, generating a good return. And, you know, if meat started looking tough because people started saying, wow, it's not sustainable, it's not as healthy as we thought it was, you know, the market would shift. But it would have to happen gradually because you're going to have dislocation. I mean, all that, you know, even, even wheat prices are going up, grain prices are going up, it's causing a lot of pain in the meat industry, and that's just, you know, that shows what happens when these year-to-year -year changes happen. Um, you know, so there would be dislocation. So you want your changes to be gradual. Thank you. Good question. Hi. Um, you talked a lot about the, uh, what the government can do, the people, the farmers. I was wondering what you, what you thought your, your favorite food-related nonprofit was. My favorite food-related nonprofit. Oh wow. Um, well, the one I'm actually sort of familiar with is um, Catholic Relief Services, which, you know, it's uh, I don't know if it's actually nonprofit, um, but the idea that an organization gets out there, what they do is, I mean, they do many things, but one of the things they do is they get in and they establish relationships in countries that are having food security problems, and they get in on the ground and work with farmers to you know, develop better farming techniques, and then once they've showed farmers how to actually produce enough food, they show them how to sell it, how to market it, because that's a lot of the problems is farmers produce a lot of food, but there's no place to sell it because they don't have an established market. Those kinds of business-related solutions that actually allow people to make some money, those are pretty critical, and so groups like Catholic Relief Services that are pushing that, I, I really think those are important, because you know, if you're just trying to, if you're just trying to come up with a a stamp of approval that says this is organic. Um, organic is meaningless to people who, who aren't getting enough to eat. It, you know, grass-fed beef doesn't mean anything to them. Free range, it's pointless. This big heirloom tomato that costs four bucks a pound doesn't matter if you're not getting enough to eat. So as we reform the food system, we're not just taking care of foodies. We need to be taking care of folks that are, you know, struggling right now and groups that can help them on the ground, not just feeding them, giving them food, but, you know, not just giving them fish, as they say, but showing them how to fish is absolutely critical. Um, with, with the amount of jobs that they're reducing as far as extension services and the ones that they're planning on reducing just in the state of Texas, wouldn't it make sense to take some of the subsidized money for the corn, since we know it's a problem, put that back into 4-H and FFA programs to teach children more about food like they did in the 50s. I think that's a, that, that's a really important, what, what she's mentioning is the extension, all the, all the, the systems that we had for taking the, the, the information that we were producing in laboratories about how to produce food better and we were extending that into the community was through all these programs, through extension, through 4-H, FFA, all these programs that were sort of connecting the community with the scientific community and those are all being defunded and, and, and we're losing this sort of really important connection. So I would support that. that. That would make sense to take the money that we should be taking away from subsidies and putting it into this thuse. But I'd want to see something different. 